and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design Deducts Podcast. Our guest today is Lee Sean. Welcome. Hi, Lefteris. Thank you so much for having me. It's fantastic to have you here. I so love that tell us jingle. about you and your work. Yeah, sure. Where do I even begin? <laughs> so I'll give some highlights. I have a pretty diverse and non-traditional design background, uh, but I'll start with what I'm doing these days. So I work with AIGA as the design education manager. So I support the design educators community. I am a design educator myself, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about later. And then I've also been running my own design practice called FUSA uh, since 2013. And we've evolved over time, starting out with branding and UX work. Nowadays, we do a lot of facilitation and organizational training on design thinking, service design, storytelling, creativity, uh, things like that. But um, I got into design through music, actually. So I um, was a musician, or I guess I am a musician for a long time, but I used to play more formally in uh, different bands. And we were making our own graphics, like our album covers, stickers, t-shirts, you know, all those things that you need when you're uh, a musician. And so through that, I learned Photoshop and uh, some basic web design at the time. And then that turned into a side business uh, that was making more money than uh, the music at, at that certain moment. And then I realized, oh, I could do this. And so I kind of took a shift. I studied political science, international relations in college. And uh, then I realized, oh, I can actually uh, do something creative uh, for money as well. And so I ended up doing a master's uh, at New York University in interactive media. So I've always been combining technology, design, art, and things like that. But that's the kind of high level. Fantastic. So it looks like we got the same beginnings. What instrument did you play? I was trained in uh, piano, okay. so classical piano, but then I moved over to just kind of keyboard stuff uh, in more like rock bands. I played in a, a salsa band actually briefly in Japan. Mm -hmm. And then I've also played a little bit of uh, cello and then ukulele is my main instrument now because it's just more, more portable and smaller. Fantastic. So you're still practicing. Fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So uh, how did you get into teaching? How did I get into teaching? So I actually got into teaching before I got into design. Uh -huh. My first job out of undergraduate uh, was teaching in Japan. So I did something called the JET program. It's the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. It's run by the Japanese government where they recruit international university graduates, mostly from English speaking countries. And we teach English in local Japanese schools. And so I went to do that to experience living in another country to improve my Japanese skills, which I had started in, in university. And um, so I was teaching uh, then and then um, kind of fast forward, I moved back here to the US, um, worked in design for a little bit. And then it was just through some happenstance that I got into teaching design. Um, so uh, Cheryl Heller, who started the MFA Design for Social Innovation program at the School of Visual Arts, uh, met my former boss, uh, Jeremy Hyman's on a bus, on a shuttle bus at a conference up in Maine. And they kind of hit it off. Jeremy introduced me to Cheryl. Cheryl was building out this program at the time. And so we got connected and she invited me to uh, to come teach. And then all my other teaching gigs have really been just through networking uh, since then. So it's been a nice compliment to uh, my private practice. Fantastic, fantastic. So what are the latest projects you're working on right now? Latest projects I'm working on right now. So I have also a, a show and a podcast. The podcast, uh, we did our last release in December, but we'll be coming back later this year. But I've been doing a weekly uh, show called Design Future Live um, on the AIGA Design Instagram channel. So I get to meet a lot of designers kind of doing what you're doing, but with the roles uh, reversed in a different way. Um, I've been supporting the design educators community at AIGA on um, their content series and rebooting Dialectic, which is uh, the academic journal uh, that we publish over there. And then in my own work, um, I have been exploring some, some personal research on the connection between design and magic, and uh, magic in a very broad sense of the term and trying to understand what it means through, say, an 
anthropological lens and a historical lens. So that's kind of in early stages right now. And then oh. I've been doing some, yeah. So, so what, yeah. What, what can you tell us a bit more about, about your, that project? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm thinking about ways to make it more of like a transmedia project. So I think the dream version of it would be to do like a documentary, so video, film kind of documentary. But I am very much someone who gets overwhelmed by super big projects where you're just working behind the scenes and then you do a big release. So I feel like I want to do something where I'm kind of working in public in a way, whether it's through blog posts or uh, podcasts that are around this theme. But the main idea is that design and art was kind of born out of magic, whether it's in, you know, these prehistoric shamanic traditions, those cave paintings um, at Lascaux and these other sites around the world. And, you know, kind of fast forward through the Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution and this very much um, business-oriented situation we're in today, there's this push towards the rational, right, and the measurable, which is good on one side of things. But then on the other, I think we are ignoring that a lot of design work, whether you're creating experiences or services touch on the human subconscious and on things that appear to be magic, right? Uh, Arthur C. Clarke has that famous quote of uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. So there's magic as this experiential thing. And then um, kind of final point I'll make for this answer is that we have this ambivalent attitude towards magic, right? On one hand, we'll say like, oh, that was a magical experience visiting Disneyland, or it was a magical enchanting customer experience if you have that in some you know, really good service design. But then on the other hand, it's something that we use in a pejorative way as well, right? There's like, oh, there's no magic bullet for this problem, or it's not magic. And I've been looking at different writers on design talking about this. And uh, so there's very much this like, tension so it's like we both want magic but then we also want to prove to especially business audiences that design is not magic that it's all rational but we don't we don't really know everything about how it how it works mm -hmm. fantastic that's very interesting that's very interesting what are the uh, greatest uh, design education challenges you you have highlighted with with, with aiga and and your work so far yeah i think first of all it's a challenge being a national professional association with an increasingly international audience that design education is not monolithic. And so we have to really segment uh, the work we do. The design educators community, one of the main things we do is providing community and networking opportunities for design educators. But a lot of the um, programming is also providing opportunities for design educators to get tenure uh, in tenure systems, whether it's publishing opportunities um, or leadership and service opportunities, um, but also providing content for folks who are not on that tenure track, whether they're adjuncts or um, other kind of uh, contractual uh, faculty in different ways. So the other part of the challenge, I think, is this balance between design education that's preparing designers as kind of engaged citizens, um, and just in engaged, educated people, and then the more uh, vocational part of that training, right? And that tension, especially in design schools and universities, compared to, say, like these boot camps and these other um, alternatives that have sprung up and become quite popular recently. Hmm. So uh, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you consolidate that? Yeah, how do we consolidate that? Um, I think right now um, our focus has been on talking about the value of design education. Um, it's not that we're against boot camps or, or things like that, but our membership and the people who are in the steering committee of the design educators community, they're um, usually faculty members in university programs or in design school programs. So that is our focus just on the virtue of that's where our community is and that's where uh, people are. Um, we've done things in different ways. So I've talked about dialectic. Uh, a couple years ago, when I first joined uh, AIGA actually, we published a series called Design Futures, uh, which was 
uh, research led by Meredith Davis, which was based on looking at the trends, right, of like, where is design going, seeing that traditional graphic design jobs are going away in the U.S. context, more and more designers are working in tech uh, context, and so a lot of it was this dealing with this uh, identity crisis, if you will, right, of designers, do we have to learn coding, do we have to learn big data, all of these sort of things I don't think we have answers for, but it's holding space for these conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you had a magic wand, which is <laughs> pertinent to your magic research, what would you uh, change or, or you know, in design education? What would I change in design education? Wow. Well, one thing would be to just make it a lot more accessible. Um, I think that's one of the challenges of just the cost of design education and how it's not necessarily as scalable if you want to keep the system of studios and um, smaller group attention uh, to design crits and things like that. But unfortunately, in the US system, um, it is just increasingly expensive in a way that I don't think is sustainable. So if we care about things like uh, equity and diversity in the design field, I think we really have to work on that cost uh, issue. Right, right. Yes, I mean, I mean, it's also uh, about uh, under making making people understand what it is we, we're doing, because totally, uh, my experience so far, I find that uh, some some of the students uh, do not do not exactly have uh, the complete understanding of, of you know what they're in for, <laughs> and, right. and sometimes from from the outside it, it can look some as something that's sort of. Uh, not, it's not easy, you know, so something that's quite uh, sort of walkable, you know, but <laughs> it's it's actually more challenging than ever before, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And it goes back to this idea, like when I was in grad school at NYU, we were explicitly told that, you know, the master's program we were in wasn't necessarily helping us to get our first job after grad school. It was helping us with our, our last job, right, or helping us... Um, learn how to learn and, and change with the times. And so a lot of the, the quote unquote technical hard skills that I learned, whether it was like how to do things in flash, which doesn't exist anymore, things like that are, are totally obsolete, but it's not, doesn't mean that my grad education was uh, worthless, right? It's, it was great for the network. It was great for helping me think through things, helping me with uh, this sense of self-confidence and, and all of that. But I also realized that I'm in a privileged position to be able to talk about that, you know, 10 years later, uh, 11 years later, um, versus graduates today who really have to, especially given the cost issue and, and the student loan burden here in the States of like, okay, like, how do you get your first job, right? And so that tension between the vocational and the more, I guess, um, you know, personal and like, uh, bigger, more transcendental part of that education, that tension is really hard, especially given the costs. Absolutely, absolutely. How can our viewers and listeners best find you? Yeah, so I am very easy to find. I've been on the internet for a long time. Uh, you can find me at Lee Sean, so it's L-E-E-S-E-A-N on pretty much every social network I'm on. I have not joined TikTok yet, but I'm on all of the other ones or um, at AIGA Design is where you can find uh, the stuff I'm doing at AIGA. Fantastic, fantastic. What advice would you like to leave us with? What advice would I like to leave you with? I think... One piece of advice that I learned, I think I already mentioned, is that you don't always have to chase the new thing. I think we often think about innovation as like, oh, well, there's some new software package that I have to learn. And if you're interested, by all means, learn that. And if you think that's useful, learn it. But at the same time, there's this flip side, which is like, what do you give up? Um, and we often think about our tools and, and what we do as part of our identity. but so the other part of innovation and kind of progressing is also learning like what you give up, whether it's like you become a manager and you give up some of the day-to-day hands-on design work, or you give up certain tools because there are new ones that are better uh, for the tasks. And so I like to encourage people to think about that too. It's not just the new, but that we have limited time. So you sometimes have to make that trade off and be explicit about what you give up. Fantastic, fantastic. This is a very, very good conversation. Uh, looking forward to seeing you at uh, our Design Education Forum this year. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lifters. Thank and thanks everyone for listening.
right. That went really fast. How did I do? Is that okay? <laughs>